Right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, about 60 years of history. Um, going through, oh, let's see if I can get that right. The emergence from, okay, starting in 1936 with the Lambda Calculus, which is a universal programming language invented before computers existed, and going through a series of stages up to Haskell. Uh, what I want to show is the stages in the development of purely functional, higher order, polymorphically typed, lazy languages, of which Haskell is the best known example. Um, I, don't, I won't claim to cover everything that happened in between these two dates, but some significant things that uh, had a strong influence on me or, or I had a, a hand in. Uh, let's start with the Lambda Calculus. Um, right, here we are. The Lambda Calculus, which, of which the first complete and correct definition was in 1936 by Alonzo Church, um, is a typeless theory of pure functions. Uh, typeless because uh, you can apply anything to anything. There's, there's no um, type discipline there. Um, pure function, a function, constructively speaking, um, is a rule or method that converts an input value into an output value. And in the theory of pure functions, the input value and the output value are both themselves going to be functions. And that sounds kind of incestuous because there isn't any data, but you can make functional representations of data. Uh, so for example, the number two is a function that takes a function and an argument uh, and applies the function twice to the argument. And the number three applies the function three times and so on. Uh, I, I'm sure most of you will have seen all these tricks. Um, True can be represented as a function of two arguments that returns the first one, false as a function of two arguments that returns the second one, and so on. So you get functional representations of data. Um, there are just three rules in the lambda calculus. Alpha, the first rule, which is alpha conversion, says that you can make systematic change of bound variable. And here note that I'm using the substitution operation square brackets y for x in E, which uh, Guy Steele was talking about yesterday. So what that means is uh, change all free occurrences of x to y in E. Um, and that's called alpha conversion. And in fact, you, uh, there are a couple of um, things you have to be careful of. First of all, that you must only replace free instances of x by y, and secondly, if y itself is an expression which might have free variables in, if any of those free variables occur bound in E, then uh, you have to do alpha conversion. So you actually need alpha conversion to define this square bracket slash operation. Uh, so the whole thing is a bit incestuous, and it's quite easy to get wrong and the earliest published papers about the lambda calculus, the ones before 1936, had er errors in to do with uh, variable capture. But anyway, assuming you've got that right, there's alpha conversion, which says that the choice of bound variable names doesn't matter. Um, rule beta says that you can apply a function to an argument, and what you do is you substitute the argument, the actual parameter, into the function body. So you have A for X in B. So you need uh, the substitution operator to define uh, beta reduction. And eta reduction is a kind of tidying up rule. It says that if you have lambda X dot E X, where E doesn't contain any Xs, well, that's just the same as the function E. Um, an instance of the left-hand side of the beta or eta rule is called a redex, and performing uh, those reductions in the direction shown by the arrow, uh, if you keep doing that, you will get to a normal form if there is one. 
uh, a normal form being a lambda term that has no redexes in. Um, as I mentioned already, there are functional representations of natural numbers and other data. And there are three really important theorems about the lambda calculus. The Church-Rosser theorem says if you start with some lambda term A, and let's say it will have multiple redexes in it, and you reduce it through one method to get B, but hitting on some other redexes, you can also reduce it to B prime, then there is a point of convergence. There's going to be a lambda term C such which you can reach from both B and B prime. Uh, so you never get into a blind alley. You can always get back onto the same path. And that tells us that when, if normal forms exist, they must be unique up to alpha conversion. Um, the second church roster theorem tells us how to find the normal form if there is one. Uh, you keep reducing the leftmost redex. There are actually two ways of defining the leftmost redex. Because you can have one redex inside another, you might mean leftmost outermost, or you might mean leftmost innermost. And it doesn't matter which of those you choose. It's still a normalizing reduction strategy. You will reach the normal form if there is one. And the third important fact about lambda calculus is Bohm's theorem, discovered by Corrado Bohm. If A and B are lambda terms with distinct beta eta normal forms, then there is a context C such that applying C to A will yield true and applying C to B will yield false. False, sorry, lambda x, y dot x and lambda x, y dot y are true and false. Our functions are carried here. Lambda x, y dot x means lambda x dot lambda y dot x. Okay, um, so that says if two terms have distinct normal forms, uh, um, you can separate them strongly. You can do a conditional branch on them. And what an immediate consequence of that is that alpha, beta, eta conversion is the strongest possible equational theory on, on normalizing terms. So it's not just a theory of, pure function, of typeless pure functions. The lambda calculus is the theory of typeless pure functions. Um, if you added a single extra rule uh, between a single extra conversion between normalizing terms, the whole theory would become inconsistent because you'd be making true equal to false. Okay. So from the second Church-Rosser theorem, we can, <coughs> we can deduce something, which is that in general to find the normal form, to be sure of finding the normal form if there is one, you must substitute actual parameters into function bodies unevaluated, which is what we now call uh, lazy evaluation. Um, whereas it, that has an efficiency disadvantage because if you copy the actual parameter into the function body and the formal parameter occurs in several places, you're going to get several copies of the actual parameter, so you're going to do unnecessary work. So when people started implementing functional languages, they actually chose to use call by value. That is, to evaluate the actual parameter before you pass it in. Um, but it's an incorrect reduction strategy for lambda calculus uh, because you may fail to find the normal form when there is one. Nevertheless, from 1960, everyone did it that way. Uh, the thesis of Chris Wadsworth, who was a, uh, a PhD student of Christopher Strachey, he and I were in the same room, uh, but I was a year younger than him, he, he showed that you could overcome the efficiency disadvantages of normal order reduction by doing it on graphs instead of on trees. So then what you substitute in <coughs> for what you replace the occurrences of the form parameter by is a pointer to a shared instance of the actual parameter. And that way you only <coughs> reduce it once. Um, I took that idea and a few years later did it on combinators. 
combinatory logic and lambda calculus evolved together, both in the late 20s and 1930s. Um, combinatory logic, you have a, a, a small number of constant functions like S and K and I, and you can show that any lambda expression can be translated into an SK molecule. By a molecule, I mean something that's just built with application. Uh, so you can translate backwards and forwards between lambda calculus and combinators. Combinators have the advantage that they have much simpler reduction rules. Um, you don't have to worry about searching for bound and free variables and doing alpha conversion and all that stuff. Um, so I showed in 1979 that you could compile a lambda calculus-based language, which was called SASL, to SK combinators, do graph reduction on the combinators, and then you got a reasonably, well, it was an interpreter, not a compiler, but reasonably efficient, as interpreters go, implementation of lazy evaluation. And then Thomas Janssen and Leonard Augustson um, went a step further. Instead of using fixed combinators like S, K, and I, they extracted program-specific combinators from the high-level language, from the program text, um, by a process called lambda lifting. And then you can compile the reduction rules for those program-specific combinators. And this is the way to go if you want to do lazy evaluation on stock hardware. Uh, whereas my method would have worked uh, if you wanted to build special purpose hardware that did SK reduction. And some people tried that. Arthur Norman at Cambridge built an SK reduction machine. Burroughs Corporation that I consulted for in the 1980s built an SK reduction machine. But uh, Thomas Janssen and Leonard Augustin's method is better if you want to compile for stock hardware, for Intel chips or whatever. And that was further developed by Simon Peyton Jones into the spineless tagless G machine, which underlies the Glasgow Haspel compiler, GHC. So over a period of how many years is that? I don't know, about 25 years, lazy evaluation was implemented more and more efficiently until it became practical in production use. Um, OK, so now going back into our timeline, uh, we started with the Lambda Calculus in, 1906, in 1936. The first functional language that had a significant user community was LISP, developed by John McCarthy at MIT starting in 1958. Uh, his famous paper in 1960 is called um, uh, something like Symbolic... Let's just find it. There we are. I ought to remember that. Uh, recursive functions of symbolic expressions and their computation by machine. Very famous paper of 1960. Um, right. In LISP, you have symbolic data, which consists of words, you know, just like Fred or David, or it could be a number, so atoms, uh, and you combine things by pairing. Uh, so you can build um, pairs of pairs of pairs of words, so you can get arbitrary lists, trees, graphs, and so on. Uh, you can do anything you want with, with just atoms and pairing. And these things are called S expressions. Um, S expressions are of variable size, and they can outlive the procedure or function that creates them. And a very far-sighted decision of John McCarthy in 1960 was not to burden the programmer with allocate and dispose instructions. He wanted, even though it was a complicated thing to do at the time, he wanted the... Um, uh, the, pro, the, the runtime system to automatically figure out when data was no longer required and, and garbage collected. So probably the most important single thing in LISP, I would say, was the invention of the garbage collector. Um, right, so you had the S language, which is just um, made from atoms and pairing, and then the M language was a first-order functional language 
for manipulating S expressions. It has comps car and CUDA for building and decomposing pairs. It has tests, conditional expressions, and recursion, and that's all. And this is computationally complete. McCarthy showed that you can code an arbitrary flowchart as mutually recursive functions. Okay. Now, M language programs could themselves be coded as S expressions, and then you have a function called eval, which interprets the S, the S expression which represents an M language program. So you have metaprogramming using eval and quote. And McCarthy, if you read his paper, he was clearly of the view that it didn't matter that you didn't have higher order functions because you could get the same effect by using eval and quote, by doing metaprogramming, which is actually a slightly different thing from higher order functions. Right, some myths about Lisp. Pure Lisp never existed. Lisp had assignment and go to before it had conditional expressions and recursion. It started as a dialect of Fortran 2, to which McCarthy added the things that he needed for programming with symbolic expressions. Second uh, myth to be disposed of, Lisp was not based on the lambda calculus, despite its use of the word lambda to denote functions. McCarthy's uh, inspiration was Kleene's work on first-order recursion equations. The M language was first order. Um, the first Lisp manual I encountered, this was in the early 70s, was the Lisp 1.5 manual, which I think was the first widely distributed Lisp, and I believe you can still get that historic manual, uh, Lisp one, the Lisp 1.5 manual. And if you look at the syntax of the M language in it, you will see that it's first order. You can't pass a function as a parameter or return it as a result. Um, but you could pass a, a function as a parameter by qu quotation, by passing in the S expression for its code. However, this gives you the wrong binding rules for free variables. You get dynamic binding instead of lexicographic. If a function has a free variable, say y in f equals lambda x dot x plus y, y should be bound to the value uh, in scope for y in the surrounding text, not in the place from which f is called. Um, and it wasn't until Scheme came along in 1975 that we got versions of Lisp that did that correctly, that had static binding rather than dynamic binding. Nowadays, all versions of Lisp are Lambda calculus-based. Right. Um, okay, on the other side of the Atlantic, also in 1960, ALGOL-60 was being defined, the inter international algorithmic language, which began in 1958 and reached an important fixed point with the publication of the ALGOL-60 report. The ALGOL-60 report is a masterpiece of precise technical writing, written in English rather than in maths. Uh, but it's, it's a wonderful example of, <coughs> of the use of natural language for precise description. Um, and in particular, right, ALGOL 60 allows nested, textually nested procedures. So um, you could have one procedure defined in, inside another procedure, and so on to any depth. Um, you can pass in procedures as parameters, but not return procedures as results. And the point about that discipline is that you can still use a, sa a stack. It's only if you can return procedures as results that you can't do it all in the stack. So one of the design aims, I assume, of ALGOL 60 was to be able to do things on a stack. Um, another very interesting thing about ALGOL 60 is if you look at the parameter passing rule, the default rule was called by name, which means you actually copy the text of the, form of the actual parameter into the procedure at, e at each place. And, the, and Peter Nauer's description of how you do this covers exactly the cases of variable clashes and the use of alpha conversion that, that you need for the lambda calculus. Whether he'd actually studied the lambda calculus or not, I don't know. But ALGOL 60, in its parameter passing mechanism, 
was much closer to the lambda calculus than Lisp. Call by name was the default, and it, and it got the rules right to avoid uh, accidental variable capture. So it had lexicographic binding. Randall and Russell, 1964, the book, a book, The Implementation of Algol 60, which describes their adventures in what I think was the first complete implementation of Algol 60, uh, used two sets of links on the stack. The dynamic chain linked each stack frame to the stack frame from which it was called. But the static chain linked each stack frame to the textually containing function call, which might be much further away on the stack. And you act, so the dynamic chain tells you how to return to your caller, the static chain tells you wh where to find the bindings of your free variables. So that was an important step forward. Um, and then later, the static chain got optimized to something called the display, which was a little vector with all your free variables in. OK, now, the next step was made by Peter Landin. Supposing we go one step further than Algol 60 and say, I, I'm not only going to allow functions to be passed in as input, I'm going to allow functions to be returned as result. Then you have the problem that a free variable might be held onto after the function call in which it was created has returned. So it won't be on, no longer be present on the stack. And Landin solved this problem in his SECD machine by taking these things called the display, which Randall and Russell had invented, and putting them in the heap. So a function is now represented by a closure which consists of a pointer to the code together with a little vector of the free variables. Um, and closures live in the heap. And the SECD machine was a very general uh, mechanism for implementing uh, any kind of programming language. Landin, Landin wrote a series of papers in the, the early 60s uh, describing the relationship between lambda calculus and programming languages. The first one in 1964 was called the mechanical evaluation of expression and it introduced the SECD machine. SECD stands for Stack Environment Control Dump. Um, the next, well, not the next paper, actually, the two papers later, in 1966, the next 700 programming languages describes an idealized language family, or perhaps I should say language template, because you could choose what, basic, what constants and basic operators you wanted to have. So you might have uh, numbers and arithmetic operators if you're doing numerical analysis, or atoms and comps, car and kuda if you're doing symbolic computation. You could plug in whatever you wanted for the basic constants and operators, but around that was this apparatus that was universal. Uh, I swim stood for if you see what I mean. And it was in three layers. The first layer, which Landin called church without lambda, was a, sug a sugaring of the lambda calculus. And with a few keywords, let, rec, and, and where, uh, you can do anything you can do in the lambda calculus without actually using the word lambda, without actually using the lambda symbol. So in, you can say expression where f of x equals stuff instead of lambda x dot stuff applied to expression. And he also introduced the, the nice syntactic idea of indentation to indicate block structure, which has uh, been copied in a number of languages, including Haskell. Gets rid of all the clumsy begin ends that you had in Algol. In the next layer, Landin added reference, mutable variables and assignment, or references and assignment. And in the third layer, he added a very powerful jump operator, the J operator, which allowed a program to capture its own continuation. Uh, but it wasn't as simple as call CC. Uh, you have to read the paper. It was called 1965, A Generalization of Jumps and Labels. So in 1965, 
Landon had already arrived at the idea of, uh, of course, of capturing your own continuation via this J operator. And you can do any kind of weird control structure, including backtracking, using the J operator. Uh, OK, so I swim was a sugared lambda calculus plus assignment plus a generalized control operator. And also in the iSwim paper, the next 700 programming languages paper, was the first appearance of algebraic type definitions, which um, Landon introduced in words. Uh, it was a few years later that Burstall invented notation for them. At the end of the 700 languages, next 700 languages paper, there is a discussion among the audience, um, which is printed at the end of the paper, it was in CACM, um, and in which Christopher Strachey raises the idea of doing all your programming in just the inner layer, just the first layer of iSwim, that is what Strachey called a DL, a purely descriptive or denotational language. And he speculated that you might actually be able to write all your programs without either assignments or jumps, uh, which is indeed true, as we all know now. Um, Right, iSwim was, was an unimplemented concept. Um, it actually, two things got implemented that were based on it. Uh, PAL at MIT by Art Evans and Duncan at Argonne National Laboratory by um, John Reynolds. And they're both very similar. I got to know PAL because when I started as a PhD student in 1968, uh, Joe Stoy, who was working with Christopher Strachey, gave me a tape from MIT which had the, uh, the PAL interpreter on it. So that was my introduction to programming languages, was figuring out what was going on inside PAL. And the garbage collector was the hardest thing to understand. It was a compacting garbage collector. Um, okay, so uh, oh, it had all these funny variables in it called S, E, C, and D and I wondered what they were for a bit until I uh, read Landon's paper. Okay, um, so PAL was in three layers. Applicative PAL was sugared lambda calculus, um, and it had shallow pattern matching. You could say that kind of thing. Let x, y, z equal expression, so that would take apart a three list and give names to the parts. Um, Imperative PAL, which was the next layer, that was uh, LPAL, adds mutable variables and assignment, and then JPAL added first-class labels. And Art Evans had the idea, instead of using the J operator, you're just allowed to set labels, L colon, anywhere inside a function, and then you could pass out the label and jump to it later, which means you could jump back into a procedure implication that had already executed, which is a way to do backtracking. So you could do uh, all kinds of amazing control structures with first-class labels. And the PhD uh, project that I was originally given was to find an efficient way of implementing PAL, including these weird jumps. And, uh, well, I never found one, because it means you can't have a stack at all. Everything has to live in the heap, because your stack frame can't be thrown away when you exit it because someone might jump back into it. Um, okay, uh, PAL was typeless in the sense of like Lisp, has runtime type checking. First class labels allowed unusual control structures, uh, coroutines, for example. Uh, the standard example where you need coroutines is you've got two trees of different shapes and they have uh, leaves and you want to go around the fringe of the tree and see if they have the same leaves in the same order, but they're different shapes. And you can do that with coroutines because you have two different recursive functions, two different invocations of a recursive function, each recursing over one of the trees, and they're talking to each other with a, with a resume, you know, interrupt and resume. Um, <coughs> and... Uh, an example where you need backtracking is writing a general purpose parser. And one of the things on the PAL tape from MIT was a five-line package 
for parsing an arbitrary BNF, which used first-class labels to do backtracking. Um, okay. So when I, I after um, I, I never finished that PhD, which was implementing PAL efficiently, and uh, on the basis of a promise that I was about to finish my PhD, which wasn't quite true, uh, I got offered a job uh, at uh, St. Andrews as a lecturer, and I gave a course on programming language theory uh, using all the stuff that I'd learned from Strachey and Scott in my first term. And during that course, I invented a simple denotational language, which was basically the applicative subset of PAL, just as a blackboard notation to show them what you could do with a sugared lambda calculus. And my colleague, Tony Davy surprised me by implementing it over the weekend. <laughs> he implemented this in Lisp, so then we had to give it a name, and I called it St. Andrew's Static Language. And I re-implemented it in BCPL, so as we could get better error messages, because um, it's hard to debug a program if the error messages are coming from a different language. Um, so SASL was the applicative subset of PAL with two uh, changes. I introduced multi-level pattern matching. So, um, well, uh, we'll see an example in a, in a minute. Uh, and whereas in PAL, string had been a primitive data type, I decided to make strings just lists of characters, which meant that all the um, list processing apparatus you had, cons, car, could, uh, except I called them, I called it cons, head and tail, and map, and so on, could be used on strings. So it unifies string processing, list processing. So those were the two ideas I had that were improvements. So SASL was, uh, so it dates from about January 1973. It, it was a call by value language. It was dynamically typed. It had let and rec, no explicit lambda, I, uh, which makes it easier to teach if you don't have any explicit lambdas. Courage functions, and with a lambda calculus-like notation, left association, the left association rule, the function application. The data types were integers, truth values, characters, lists, and functions. All data had the same rights, so first-class functions. And I used it for teaching functional programming instead of LISP. And its advantages over LISP for teaching FP were, first of all, that it was a pure sugaring of lambda calculus, with no imperative features and no eval quote uh, distractions. Um, it had the correct scope rules for free variables, which in those days LISP didn't have. Um, and it had multi-level pattern matching, which is a big plus for readability. If I can just show you this example. So we want to, we've got a pair of pairs. Look at the let expression. I've got a pair of pairs, so it's pair of pair AB and pair CD, and I want to rearrange it in the way that you see. So I say let ABCD equal X, that names the parts, and then put them back together in a different order. And the equivalent, equivalent Lisp code is above. And you can see it's much more opaque. Uh, I cheated slightly because you don't have to say car of car of X you can say car of x with two a's and so on. But even so, it's much less readable than the pattern matching. So multi-level pattern matching was a big step forward. And I don't know if SASL was the first language to have it, but it was certainly an early language to have it. Uh, SASL, like Lisp, had runtime typing. Uh, why was this? Um, Lisp and similar languages were used for computation over symbolic data. So they had to write functions that worked on lists, trees, graphs, and so on. And this leads to a need for structural polymorphism. If you are recursing, say you're reversing a list, you don't need to know what the type of data is. And uh, at that time, the only way to handle this was to delay type checking until runtime. Polymorphic typing uh, hadn't come along yet. So here's a a nice example of what you can do with dynamic typing that's very hard to do in a statically typed language. So I've got a 
a curried function of an unknown number of Boolean arguments that returns a Boolean result, okay? And I want to know if it's a tautology. That is, is its, tr is its truth table true in, in all the rows? Okay, so you can test that in this very simple way. You don't know what its arity is. It's a curried function of unknown arity. So the first thing you do is test if it's a Boolean. A Boolean function of zero arity is just going to be true or false as a curried function. So if it's a Boolean, then that's the answer. It's a tautology if and only if it's true. Uh, whereas if it's a function, then what you've got to do is apply it one layer to true and to false and check that both of those functions, which have arity one less, are themselves tautologies. So two-line uh, two tautology test there. Uh, it's very difficult to do in a strongly typed language. Uh, if there's time, I'll show you how we can try and do it in Haskell. Uh, Sassel evolved gently during the 1970s. I dropped rec, and recursion became the, the default. Mutual, so everything was in everything else's scope, uh, an idea which went from Sassel into Miranda and then into Haskell. So you don't have to worry about, uh, you can recurse arbitrarily without announcing that you're doing so. In 1976, Sassel underwent a small revolution. It became lazy. And in fact, three papers appeared in 1976 about lazy evaluation. There was Kant should not evaluate its arguments by Dan Friedman, who's sitting here in the front row, and David Wise. Um, there was a lazy evaluator by Henderson and Morris, and there was my lazy Sassel manual, also of 1976. So it seemed that lazy evaluation was an idea whose time had come. Um, I, uh, I got it from the Lambda calculus. I decided to, um, to use normal order, something equivalent to normal order reduction. Um, and at the same time, I introduced, I already had pattern matching, uh, I, I used pattern matching now not only for naming the parts of a complex structure, but also to define functions by case analysis with different patterns on the left-hand side, which, is, which idea I got from John Darlington. Um, I implemented Lazy Sassel using the, a lazy version of the SCCD machine, which I got from a book by, by Wilf Burge, called Recursive Programming Techniques. I don't know if that book's still in print. Um, it was very inefficient, the lazy SECD machine. And so when I, I got to Kent in 1977, I re-implemented Lazy Sassel by translating to SK combinators and doing combinator graph reduction. And also during the early 80s, I added floating point numbers and list comprehensions. Um, why, why laziness? First of all, for consistency with Church's lambda calculus. The second church Rosser theorem says that if we want to be sure of finding the normal form, we need to substitute in uh, actual parameters unevaluated. It's also, lazy evaluation is also better for equational reasoning. You can substitute equals for equals without worrying about non-termination. Um, and it allows you to write programs using infinite lists, because the infinite lists actually come into being piecemeal as, as you explore them, and that gives you a way to do interactive I.O. Um, and lazy evaluation renders, I, I, I came to realize, it rendered the exotic control structures that I'd played with in, in PAL uh, unnecessary. For example, you don't need coroutines because you can solve the equal fringes problem by just creating the fringes of both trees as lists and comparing them element by element. But because of lazy evaluation, um, the recursive exploration of the trees will just happen piecemeal and only go as far as you need until you find the first point at which they differ. So lazy, uh, the infinite list get rid of the, and the laziness gets rid of the need for coroutines and the list of successes method uh, replaces backtracking.
There's a famous paper by Phil Wadler of 1985 replacing a failure by a list of successes, which has a very elegant series of examples showing this is a general method for getting rid of backtracking. Now, I actually had um, an example in my 1976 manual, which was the, eight, uh, the solution to the eight queens problem using the list of successes method. And at some level, I clearly understood that it was a general method, because that becomes apparent in, a, in, a, in my KLC paper, but I didn't have a name for it. Um, and it, it, uh, giving a name to things enables people to see the, their, their generality and to use them. Um, right, Sassel got exported to uh, quite a few sites, so I don't know if I can make this smaller. Uh, those were all the places that were running Sassel. This would be in the mid-80s. This was the Combinators implementation of Sassel. Those were all universities, and there were three companies. So 24 educational sites, three commercial. There may have been other ones that I didn't know about, those ones I knew about. So I think Sassel was almost certainly the first lazy language that acquired a significant user community, first purely functional lazy language that acquired a significant user community. Um, Bodo, how much time have I got? Fifteen. Okay, fine. Um, right. Going back to the 1970s again, stuff was happening in Edinburgh. Um, in his paper on structural recursion, uh, these slides will be in the proceedings somewhere. People will be able to get at them, won't they? Yeah, through the website. Um, all the references are at the end on the last couple of slides, okay? So there's a paper of Burstall, 1969, in which he introduces a formal notation for algebraic type definitions, uh, something like that. Okay, there's a type tree which has an atom, which is a nil tree, and a node, something, a constructor node, which takes an atom and two trees and returns a tree. So there you've got a notation for declaring algebraic data types. Um, and Burstall introduces case expressions and, uh, stru uh, and uh, structural recursion for proving things about uh, algebraic data types. Structural induction, I mean, structural induction. Um, John Darlington, who was a PhD student of Bur Burstall, decided to replace the case expressions by uh, multi-clause pattern matching, like that, that example, which is the Fibonacci function. And that was the idea that I, I borrowed for 1976 Um Interestingly, NPL, which stood for New Programming Language, uh, John Darlington's language, also had set expressions. You could say this kind of thing. Um, set of all even x is the set of all n such that n is in x and even n. You get the idea. They were sets. Um, so I, I assume duplicates got removed. They weren't particularly efficient. Uh, M, but the idea of MPL was that you could write down a specification in this very high-level language uh, using set expressions and then do transformations to turn it into an, a recursive algorithm. And there's a, a couple of papers by Burstall and Darlington in the 1970s uh, so new programming language was first order, strongly typed, purely functional, and called by value. NPL, new programming language, evolved into HOPE, 1980, which was higher order, strongly typed, polymorphic, purely functional, and it kept multi-equation pattern matching, but dropped the set expressions. So HOPE was an important landmark. The first purely functional, polymorphic, higher order uh, language. Um, also at Edinburgh in the 1970s, ML was being developed by Robin Milner and his colleagues as the meta-language of Edinburgh LCF. That was logic for computable functions, uh, was, was a computer-based logic for reasoning about uh, domain theory and, and denotational semantics. And ML was the meta-language in which you wrote tactics for constructing proofs. And ML had, it was a sugared lambda with lambda, let, and let rec, plus references and assignment, 
it had types, it was strongly typed, uh, with type sums, type products, and type recursion, and it had polymorphism. That's the most important thing about it. Robin Milner invented a polymorphic type discipline so that you could do static typing on, on things that were polymorphic o over structure. Uh, it's a very important step. Um, ML was a call by value language. It didn't do pattern matching. You, you had explicit selectors, like, you know, go left, go right, and so on. Um, and then from that, standard ML evolved by the union of the hope stream and the ML stream. And ML uh, became an important standard. Uh, it's a higher order, strongly typed, polymorphically typed functional language, but it's not pure. It has references and exceptions. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, back at Kent, I developed a miniaturized version of Sassel for teaching, which was an experiment. Uh, I, I wrote the, com it was an interpreter, which I wrote around 1979 to 1980, and it was used for teaching up until about 1986. It was a version of Sassel without wear. Uh, it just had top level function definitions, which is actually quite an interesting challenge to program without any local variables. and. Uh, I, I dropped it after a couple of years and put the where back in. You really do need local variables. But it's an interest, it was an interesting uh, discipline to programming without. Uh, KRC dropped conditional expressions because the idea was it was going to be a sort of functional basic. So it was line-oriented and had a built-in line editor. Um, and so I replaced the conditional expressions by guarded equations, something like, like this example. Okay, the guards will now be familiar from Haskell, except Haskell puts the guards on the left-hand side of equals instead of on the right. Okay, uh, combining pattern matching with guards gives a significant gain in expressive power. KRC also had list comprehensions. I took over John Darlington's set expressions, turned them into lists, and the lists were lazy. And list comprehensions with lazy lists uh, are very powerful. Okay. Um, and actually, there is a website there, krclang.org, uh, which has uh, some papers and the resurrected software. A colleague of mine translated my ancient BCPL into C. The software is a bit wobbly, because uh, the garbage collector sometimes falls over, but it works well enough that you can see what was in KLC and what you could do with it, if anyone wants to look at that. Uh, Miranda was Sassel with the where, KLC with the wares put back in, um, plus a polymorphic type system, which I lifted from the original ML. Uh, standard ML hadn't appeared yet. Um, Miranda was developed in the early, uh, 83 to 86. Um, Combining guards with where raises a puzzle about the scope rules, um, and the where clause has to govern a whole right-hand side with all the alternatives, rather than just one expression. Okay. Um, so going back to the... Yeah. If you, if you wanted to... Uh, if that was a more complicated set of expressions on the right-hand side there, and you wanted to have a local variable the where would cover all of the guarded right, the whole set of right-hand sides. Yeah. So, and the way that that's come out in Haskell is that you have let expressions and where definitions. So, um, in Miranda, I invented the where definitions. Okay. Uh, another thing that had to happen once I put these things together was you needed a lexical distinction between functions and constructors so that you could distinguish pattern matching from function definition. So the idea I hit on, which was to, um, was to use initial capital letters for the constructors. A, a simple idea, but it caught on. Haskell does exactly the same. So node x, y equals stuff is a pattern match, 
you're naming, uh, you, you're giving names x and y to parts of stuff, whereas lowercase node x, y equals stuff is a function definition. Okay. Um, so Miranda, still, it still exists. Um, it's lazy, purely functional, has list comprehensions. It's polymorphic with type inference and optional type specifications. Uh, then there's a 1986 paper which was originally in SIG plan notices for December 1986, an overview of Miranda. It was first released in 1985 with subsequent releases in 1987, 1989. It was quietly, quite widely adopted, but it was an interpreter, not a compiler. Uh, and it got gradually replaced by Haskell because Haskell had a compiler, ran on far more things, and was faster. Also, Haskell was open source, whereas uh, you actually had to buy a, li a license for Miranda, which uh, obviously impeded its spread. Um, Okay, uh, there's a website, miranda.org.uk, where there are papers, and again, uh, the software is there. It only runs under Unix, but that includes uh, Sigwin. So you, you, you can, if you want to play with Miranda, you can find it there. Okay, so now let's jump to Haskell. That has many similarities to Miranda, the most immediately noticeable changes are, are two lexical changes. The, the guards are switched to the left-hand side of the equation, and that's logical because the guards modify the patterns. You introduce variables in your pattern match, and then uh, you can uh, have several tests on those uh, variables, so uh, that's logical. Um, and the other important lexical change is I had this clumsy star notation, which I got from the original ML for polymorphic types. So in Miranda, the type of map was written like that. Doesn't look too bad with two type variables, but if you've got something with five type variables in, it gets awfully clumsy. Uh, <coughs> Phil Wadler had the very simple idea of using lowercase letters and then you have uppercase words for type constants, uppercase words for type constructors more generally, and lowercase words for type variables. Very simple idea, but I think it's the nicest single thing in Haskell is uh, the introduction of single letter variables for type variables instead of all these wretched stars. Um, there's more important things in Haskell than that. Haskell has more or less everything that was in Miranda uh, with the same or similar syntax in most cases, but it added very important new features. Type classes and monadic I.O. being the two most important features, and also a module system with two level names. I'll say a little bit more about type classes in a moment. Haskell has a much richer syntax, so whereas my languages have all tended to be rather minimal, I only give you one way of doing each thing, uh, Haskell is more generous. You have let and where. You have conditional equations and case uh, and so on. Yeah? You get uh, several ways of doing everything. Um, OK, so the most important uh, change in Haskell, the most important thing that Haskell introduced, that as far as I know no one had done before, is type classes. Type classes are extraordinarily powerful. Um, but also add greatly to the complexity of the type system. So you either like them or you don't. I, uh, whether I like it or I don't depends on what I'm trying to do. If I'm trying to do something that needs type classes, then I do it in Haskell. Um, I've got one example to show you. How, can I have got time for one example? No, absolutely. Oh, I'll, I'll do it. OK, you remember the tautology program in Sassel? Well, here it is in Haskell using type classes. This was my first attempt. There you go. It's a, it, it, you have to introduce a type class. OK, if you stare at that for a bit, you can see it's got two instance declarations, which are the two branches of the conditional. Um, it actually doesn't work. I tried programming that up, and I got error messages where, I've, where it says problem here. You can't actually do that kind of instance declaration 
in, in standard Haskell. You can have Arrow as an instance, but not some particular form of Arrow, if you see what I mean. It's got to, the instance, the instances have to be distinguished by their top level type constructor and not by stuff lower down as well. In GHC, there is, there's a flag for everything and, there, and there's a flag called, uh, what's it called? General, generalized instances or something, can't remember what it's called, which would enable this to run. But if you want to do it in standard Haskell, you have to write that. And uh, here is my case for typeless languages. Um, that's what it looks like in Saskel. So typeless languages haven't gone out of fashion. Lisp is still here. Uh, Erlang is typeless. And that example shows you why some people like it. Um, OK, I'll stop there to give time for questions. So we don't have time for, for a lot of questions, but I'll take at least one. I think it might be too early in the morning for that now. There we go. Uh, to what extent did the prophecy of the next 700 languages come true? Say that again. To what extent did the did the prophecy of those next 700 languages come true? Yeah, it, it didn't, uh, I guess, because um, if it had come true, all programming languages would be uh, sugared lambda calculus plus uh, references and exceptions. And uh, I, don't, you know, I don't think you could say that it did come true. Uh, well, it came true in the form of Haskell. Uh, so there were three or four programming languages that came out of Ice Cream, not 700. Um. Oh, thank you. I always think you did 700 languages on your own, though. You got a few of them. Anyway, um, time for the break. Before we do... Oh, guys, hold yeah. on. Guys, he's got a question. We've got to do this one. Yes. One more question. What do you project for the future of functional languages? What remains to be done? Oh, uh, dependent types has, has got to happen. I mean, well, it is happening. Uh, uh, I, I think dependent types is the next major step for, to have a language in general use that, that has dependent types. Uh, because that way you can, you can have proofs, uh, specifications and proofs in the program text. Uh, and also, you can do a lot with dependent types. So, yes, yeah. Idris is, is mainstream and production ready now. <laughs> you heard it here first. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Turner.